Along the California coast, teams of dedicated individuals log thousands of hours monitoring and researching some of the most special places on Earth. Stretching from Oregon to Mexico, these are the Yosemites of the seas, a string of underwater parks featuring a spectacular range of habitats. California boasts the nation's first and largest marine network, safeguarding 16% of its coastal waters. Half are off limits to fishing and other harvesting activities. And while the road to protection hasn't been an easy one, California's new ocean legacy has begun to take shape. With support from fishermen like Jim Webb, on any given day, Jim can be found somewhere on or near the water. I was kind of one of those people who seemed to think the ocean was limitless. Starting in the 90s, however, Jim began to notice changes. I actually began to see uh, fish stocks in our area declining, and I thought oh, that was pretty alarming. I, I didn't think I'd see that in my lifetime, but I did. What Jim witnessed was indeed cause for concern. Declines were reported throughout the state, from rockfish to lobster. And further afield, additional impacts signaled deep problems for the world ocean. California took note. To stay ahead of the curve, in 1999, the state adopted the Marine Life Protection Act. The act was designed to modify and expand California's ocean conservation areas. One scientist involved from the beginning is marine ecologist Rick Starr. Resource management is a science and an art because we all have different values and different interests in using marine resources. People don't like to be restricted. They view it as a curtailment of their freedom. And then there's the natural tendency uh, to think that you're going to lose your favorite fishing area. The MPA concept is, is without doubt a brilliant concept. Some other things that come along are not so, not so attractive and not so good. The uh, Central Coast uh, MLPA process was absolutely brutal and devastating to uh, a lot of the small fleet that was chased outside of the bay. You know, that's where, that's where a stakeholder process is critical because you get all those opinions on the table, you uh, hash it out as best you can, you talk about it, and, and all of that takes place before lines go on the map and you start to actually design marine protected areas. Despite the growing pains and controversies, strong partnerships formed. One example is the Collaborative Fisheries Research Program, where recreational fishermen have joined forces with scientists. Our scientists are working side by side with the fishermen, talking about the life history of fishes, talking about the uh, values of marine protected areas, and we're seeing an increased stewardship ethic related to the monitoring and protection of those MPAs. I saw what was happening with the fisheries, so I thought, well, the only way I can make any difference is to get out and help. These tireless teams have logged 21,000 hours, tagged and released more than 40,000 fish from nearly 50 species. While it is still early, a variety of responses are being documented, and some positive trends are emerging. For example, the mean lengths of lingcod and vermilion rockfishes are greater in the Año Nuevo protected sites than in the reference sites. Meanwhile, in Moss Landing, at the mouth of Elkhorn Slough, another monitoring team heads out. Elkhorn Slough is the second largest tidal marsh in California. Draining the rich agricultural lands of the Salinas Valley, the slough is home to rafts of lounging sea otters, harbor seals, and more than 200 species of shorebirds and seabirds. Tim Marisich and his wife Donna steer their fishing vessel, the Donna Kathleen, out to sea. When Tim lost his spot prawn fishery, he turned his expertise to monitoring. Tim is helping scientists gather baseline data to document changes below diver depth. Uh, work from Eureka down to San Diego for the last five years doing baseline uh, ROV work for the monitoring enterprise with, uh, with Mari and with DFNG. And I think that's been my most fulfilling uh, um, 
work. While Rick, Jim, and Tim monitor resources from ships and submersibles, additional teams monitor from land. Formerly a Coast Guard station, Año Nuevo now serves as a vital safe haven for seals, sea lions, and seabirds. Biologist Michelle Hester knows firsthand the benefits of these habitats for her feathered research subjects. And these protected areas are important because they are the reason that a lot of the seabird populations in California have recovered, essentially, from many years of decline. As Michelle's teams bolster nesting areas, ecologist Dan Robinette and his teams gather data farther down the coast. Dan has been studying California seabirds since 1999. The California coastline has a whole suite of, of coastally breeding seabirds, the cormorants, the guillemots, that do stay close to shore, that do forage in these MPAs, and they will benefit from the protection that these MPAs offer. For Dan, working with seabirds is like having another partner in the field. Seabirds can also illuminate how rapidly fish populations are reproducing and growing. So by looking at where the seabirds are foraging, understanding what types of fish they're taking each year, that should give us an idea of what areas are important to protect. These areas also provide safe haven for many prey species. And wherever prey abounds, predators are sure to follow. Using state-of-the-art tracking technology, Barbara Block and her Tagging of Pacific Pelagics project, TOP, have tracked some of the ocean's most feared and revered animals. With more than 270,000 tracking days from 23 different species, her team is revealing the wild vitality of the California current. By creating reserves such as Año Nuevo, we have a place where elephant seals and white sharks, two natural predator and prey, can be close to one another, and our tags show that they go as far as four to 5,000 miles away every year. And then what's amazing is the tags then show they come back and are within feet of each other again. And by having the reserve, we've created a location where the natural predator and prey relationships exist, not disturbed by fishing vessels or human interactions with these animals. And it becomes this natural site that we can study, we can actually observe, and we can understand these animals even further. One person keenly aware of the importance of charismatic ocean animals is commercial dive operator Phil Samet. Last year alone, Phil spent more than 200 days underwater. For more than 20 years, Phil has explored the waters of Monterey Bay and beyond with unbound enthusiasm. This isn't how Phil first started working here when he was employed by the dive boat Cypress Sea. In 87, I started working the boat as a deckhand, and the boat primarily was taking out recreational divers who were fishermen. And the amount of take between 1987 and 1995 was very high. I mean, our goal was to spear as many fish as possible on that boat. Now, Phil's clientele is more interested in shooting pictures instead of spear guns. The overall goals have changed and that's what's now paying his bills. Of all his dive sites, Point Lobos stands among his favorites. Designated as the nation's first marine park in 1960, Point Lobos boundaries were expanded to include greater protection in 2007. Spectacular topside scenery barely hints at the deep beauty beneath the waves. A watery tribute to the park's many decades of protection and an irresistible draw for divers and filmmakers. The tide is certainly shifting. Well, I, I hope that the marine protected areas become increasingly ingrained in the fabric of our communities. And I hope that as time goes on and generations come to accept it, they'll uh, become stewards of the areas and take care of them. All the growing pains have led to a groundbreaking achievement, a network of hope spots, and a powerful legacy for California's future. <laughs>